Hi, everyone, and welcome to The X, a podcast from inside Silicon Valley about how experience shapes everything from products to businesses to entire industries. I'm Brian McLean, and I'm here with Demetrius Madrigal. Today, we're going to talk about the industry of audio, radio, podcasting, audiobooks, and the emerging social audio apps such as Clubhouse, Twitter Spaces, and the rumored Facebook competitor in development. Audio is a platform for communication, and connection is nothing new. But it does change form every so often, and it appears we are in a transitionary phase. Good morning, D. Pop quiz. List all the ways that you either received or distributed audio this morning. Oh, this morning? Uh, well, I mean, almost everything with today was through the internet. So uh, just listening to things or uh, downloaded podcasts. Podcasts are, are have become a big, big thing. So it, it's going to be interesting to look at how we got here and where it's going. It's an emerging field and it's kind of been neglected by Silicon Valley up until recently. Last week when we were talking about this, um, I had mentioned to you something like, oh, look, you know, all these new social audio apps are happening. It looks like the market is growing. And you said, pause for a second. Let's look at the data. I believe what you should be saying is, I think the market is shifting again. That the audio market might not be growing, it's just people are shifting from one platform to another or separating their time between two different types of audio platforms, like radio versus podcasting or podcasting versus social audio. Yeah. Um, do you still agree with that? Yeah, I think if, you, if, you're going, if you're going to be looking at whether or not audio as kind of a category is growing, you have to compare it to like the size of like the radio and the recording industry back in like the 70s and 80s before all of this stuff happened. So you can look at podcasts and see how like, okay, podcasts are growing. Or you can look at streaming media, uh, streaming audio and see if streaming audio is growing. But at the same time, some other aspects might be shrinking. So like from a from a, a share of like human experience of like uh, people consuming audio, that is something that you kind of have to look at holistically and determine like, all right, well, how much time are people actually contributing to consuming audio versus um, engaging in other activities? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot going on right now. I, I, I mean, like everyone I talk to is just like, oh, I was streaming this music or I was listening to this podcast or I was on the web, you know, streaming video or now I'm listening to an audio book. It's pretty integrated in our lives it feels like it's integrated a lot more than it was 10 or 15 years ago, but maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I was just sitting in my car commuting more often, right? Yeah. So I was just consuming it mostly from radio. Well, that was part of it, right? Like if you think about, for example, the rise of streaming video and just gaming, compared that to like, obviously like the, the 70s and 80s, it spent a lot less time gaming or or watching video back then than I do now. So it as a proportion of kind of human media consumption, uh, audio might be around the same or even slightly less than it was before because now there are more activities kind of taking up the time. Yeah, I also think it's that comparison between audio and video versus audio alone, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there was this period in time about five years ago where, you know, we were having lots of conversations with investors and things like that regarding the audio space. And not a lot of people believe that audio alone was going to dominate in any meaningful way. It was mostly, hey, it looks like video is really, really taken off. And I think we need to focus on streaming and video. But there always seems to be a segment for audio only, right? There, it, there's something really interesting about simply listening to something and not having to, to look at it or stare at it or kind of obsess about what's on the screen. Instead, let your mind kind of imagine what's happening while you're listening to it. And, and I know that when we were talking, you were saying you were going to do a, just a very brief little history lesson where we started and kind of where we are right now. So do you want to jump in and, and do that? And then yeah. that will kind of frame things up for us. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I think this, the, just understanding the history is really important for kind of understanding context. And once you see kind of a trajectory from, from, uh, from the past to now, it helps us to kind of see where that trajectory is, has been leading. So before about in the mid 1800s, the only way you could experience audio was live. So if you were trying to listen to music or anybody speaking or anything like that, it was live. They didn't have any form of recorded media or broadcast media until um, the first recorded audio was in the 1860s. And then 
it, it took a little while for that to catch on and Edison and Alexander Graham Bell got involved and you started seeing some of those wax cylinders and then eventually that evolved into, into vinyl discs like we have today. So it wasn't until around the, the turn of the 20th century that it started becoming an actual business and a real industry. Before that, it was just kind of pre-market technology. Uh, and then, you know, recorded audio was a huge advancement for consumers. They weren't limited to going to live shows. They weren't this, in the same way geographically limited. Like if you wanted to listen to, you know, Gershwin or or uh, any of these composers, it wasn't like you had to hop on a, on a train and travel somewhere in order to hear their music. You were actually able to hear uh, what people were producing just by picking up a, a, a wax cylinder in your local shop. The recording companies ended up being formed and albums started to be produced in the 1910s and 1920s. Before that, albums didn't really exist. So if we think about like albums and recorded media and things like that, that's really a 20th century thing that didn't really exist before that. So in our heads, I think we kind of think that like, oh, this is, you know, listening to records and things like that goes back a long way. But in, in the grand scheme of things, not really. And that is something that because it hasn't been like hundreds of years of tradition behind it, it's kind of established something that can still be changed relatively easily. Um, so then uh, what we saw were the recording companies didn't really start to, to really have some power until the 20s and then back and then further into the 40s. And their influence started to, to really get involved with radio. So radio as a, as a broadcast medium started to become commercially available in the 20s. So it was also the same time that a lot of these record companies were popping up and they were all kind of in, interacting with each other. So back then, the early radio broadcasts included news, music, but also like narrative storytelling shows like The Shadow or, or uh, Little Orphan Annie, that kind of stuff. Uh, in 1934, the FCC was formed and their entire purpose was to regulate what could be broadcast on the radio and on television and before that, there was a lot of kind of uh, consternation and people trying to figure out how are we going to make sure that our kids aren't going to be exposed to like terrible things like curse words. That was a part of the process. And then FDR's files, fireside chat starting in the 30s and stretching into the 40s for the Great Depression and World War II really elevated radio and it made it like it, it firmly established it. It's like, here's a thing that's, that's going to stay and it's, it's very mainstream. And it wasn't until after World War II that FM radio started to take over, and it had some ex advantages as far as its dis distribution. But at the same time, TV started becoming mainstream, and that took over kind of a lot of the episodic narrative storytelling. So a lot of radio became mostly about news and music. Now, what these two technologies were able to do, and we still see echoes of this today, so we have recorded physical media that kind of establishes um, listening to audio in kind of a block, usually from like a single artist, right? So that's an album or an EP, and you plug it in and you hear them uninterrupted for a period of time. And the other side of it, the other, the other model for consumption was just broadcast radio as like a continuous stream. Now, both of these at the time were curated by actual humans, but these are kind of what... The uh, when we got into digital transformation and getting into online forms of distribution, they're still largely following these two models. You get uh, EPs or albums being put up by artists that you can stream through uh, iTunes or other marketplaces, or you have a, a continuous stream of different artists being stitched together. That's where yeah. now we're kind of moving into starting in the probably in the 90s, we started moving into things moving more online. I, when I hear that, what I keep thinking is, is that how do we prevent ourselves from just replicating what we did before into an online version of it, right? So for example, when you were talking about, you know, the fireside chats during the Great Depression and and the different shows that were on then, once we started getting into television, uh, we started creating these narrative structures uh, of storytelling not only on television, but also on radio, right? Remember they used to like mm -hmm. tell those, those, you know, really scary stories and stuff and people would tune in at a specific time. Um, and then we kind of started doing the exact same thing when streaming uh, audio came out where we would just take a radio station and just stream it online, right? Yeah. 
And that transformation is not always the right way to do it, right? Because like, for example, if I'm going to listen to my favorite pop channel or something like that, maybe I don't want to hear all those commercials when I'm streaming it online. Maybe my perception is that if I'm streaming it online, I shouldn't have to have constant advertisements going on, right? So then Mm -hmm. now I'm going to look for another source where I can get the same music without advertisements, right? It just kind of like yeah. constantly keeps reforming itself. So there's, there's what you're, what you're pointing out is really interesting because what, what we're seeing, and it's not just with radio, we see this with kind of like TV now moving to streaming. The length of an album was largely determined by how much music you can fit onto a vinyl record, mm-hmm. right? It wasn't because that was the optimum length of, you know, a block of music. It's because that's what they could fit on there. So that ended up like adjusting the lengths of songs. And um, when you get into the recording process and maybe speeding things up or slowing things down or figuring out a way to to get an album into a certain album length or within a certain range of the album length. And it doesn't have to be that way. Just like with TV shows, um, you had your half hour format, which ended up being around 22 minutes with, with advertising. Um, and now that you move on to kind of the Netflix distribution model, it doesn't have to be that long. It could be, um, it doesn't have, every episode doesn't have to be the same length either. You can have some episodes that are 20 minutes and other episodes that are 35 minutes. It's more based on what the, the content requires rather than the, uh, what the uh, distribution channel requires. So back in, um, for a certain period of time, like if you watched like that documentary or not documentary, the, uh, the movie about um, Freddie Mercury and Queen, there was a lot of consternation about like, oh, this song is really long. And in the grand scheme of things, it's not. If you go back to more of the composer periods of Beethoven and that group, they were putting out songs that were 18, 20, 30 minutes long. It's just that when it got onto radio and you had to compete for that radio spot, everybody wanted their songs to be two, three minutes long. And that's not necessarily what's best for the song. So that's that's one of the ways in which it's helpful now that the limitations aren't quite the same Mm -hmm. that we can kind of rethink the format that the art would take. Well, it's artificial boundaries, right? I mean, it's kind of like the way Twitter says, oh, here's the certain number of characters you can have. And they're like, well, we'll expand that by a certain number of characters 10 years later, right? It's like by putting that artificial uh, framework around it, uh, it kind of puts everyone in the space of like, I have to work within this, right? So Mm -hmm. even though you don't, right? Like that's, you're, you're making a really good point, right? Why not make the best music possible and not really worry about how long it is? I mean, you look at podcasts now, right? Everyone's like, oh, shows need to be 30 minutes or an hour or whatever it is. It's like, where are these numbers coming from? Like make them an hour and seven minutes, make them two hours yeah. and 22 minutes and seven seconds. It doesn't really matter if it's captivating and interesting, people will listen to it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and you see, you see that a lot, but I want to talk also a little bit about the hardware side of things too, because There was a period where all we had was radio in the car and then let's say a radio at home. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to listen to something, you either put in a tape or you turn on the radio and, and, and tuned into a certain channel. In the 1990s, I started going to these PC shows. And they were basically like swap shows. You go in there and every all these vendors are set up and they're like selling, you know, CDs and floppy disks and hardware and all these different things. Because at the time, you either bought a computer right from the store or you built one yourself. And all of us, you know, like you and everyone, we were building our own computers. And one of the things that emerged, never became super mainstream, was these things called radio cards. And you would buy this card, stick it into your computer. It had an antenna, antenna built into it. And then you would load up some software and you can tune into all your favorite local channels. And then the music would play through your computer. So it was basically like, okay, I can have a radio at home, but I can also have a radio on my computer now. And then I have the radio in my, in my car, right? Yeah. And as that starts to emerge and get a little bit popular, it kind of died off really quick. And then mm-hmm. the next thing that like popped up, and I'm sure you remember this, was the quote unquote MP3 players, not the one that came from Apple. That was a lot that that was many years after these yeah. these emerged. The 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 little tiny ones that would hold like seven songs and you had to buy the music on either CDs or floppies and then transfer them over into these little pieces of hardware and put them in your pocket. And what I realized by doing all this research and us talking about all these different audio platforms and mediums was that timing means a lot when it comes to new technology. Because Apple came in and said, oh, okay, we're going to do this 
you know, way better than the previous versions where you have like five steps in order to like get audio um, on your MP3 player. But it was years after those emerged. Like, I mean, I had the, I personally had a Creative Labs MP3 player that holds, uh, held seven songs. Yeah. And and they're in MIDI format, <laughs> and then and then I had to convert them to MP3s or whatever it was. Right? It was like this kind of convoluted process. But I wanted you to talk a little bit about that, right? Like as the hardware emerges, uh, the software tends to follow, or the the music tends to flow into those new spaces. What was the the point where the mass market started to be able to consume what they wanted when they wanted it? rather than what was being pushed to them? Well, I mean, we're still not quite there, right? It's still a little bit um, like you go to Pandora and you type in the song you want to listen to. A lot of times they'll play something similar to it, right? They'll use that as kind of the blueprint. Or maybe they'll play that one song and then they'll find other songs for you to push to you. That that ultimately, much like when we talk about streaming video, is like the holy grail. I just want to listen to the song I want to listen to when I want to listen to it. So we see some platforms that that do that much more directly. Like if you go to like YouTube Music, I think Amazon uh, Prime Music does a good job with it. Spotify has been around for a while now. Has been kind of like that holy grail that we've been trying to get to, but there were technological limitations for getting us there. And now the only limitations are really just more legal and business-based rather than technological. But back in, you know, 80s, 90s, it was, I really love this song. I want to listen to it more. I'm going to sit by my radio. You remember doing this, right? Sit by my mm-hmm. radio with my with my tape recorder and record the song off the radio so I can hear it. And then I'm going to find a way to put those all onto a mixtape. And then I can show that off to my friends. That was the experience back then. And it's also still the model for like building your Spotify playlist and then showing that off, showing off your music tastes. Again, like all a lot of a lot of this is based around use case of what people want. The companies that have kind of done well have been the ones who've been able to provide that to people. Like one of the reasons why the the uh, the iPod was so transformative is because you could put your entire music collection on it. It wasn't like I have to think about a selection of songs going to put it on here for to listen to for a while, and then I'm going to have to wipe it and put different selection of songs on there. It, it just removed that that element of work from the equation. Yeah, I think where it really exploded was smartphones because a lot of people had iPods and MP3 players and that kind of stuff. And that market was kind of ripe for innovation in the sense that everyone, at least everyone I know, tends to listen to some form of music at some point, right? Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> being able to say, okay, you're going to have this thing in your pocket no matter what anyways, mm-hmm. because it's your phone, it's your lifeline, you know, it's how you communicate with everybody. So at the same time, we're also going to allow you to put as much music as you want on it or stream music directly to it. And now it opened up the floodgates. I, th- I think something I read the other day said that 98% of Americans have some phone, like some um, cellular phone that would give them the capability to have at least a little bit of music, whether it's stored on there or or streamed on there, right? That's huge. You're addressing a market that is, you know, not only worldwide, but like in the United States, it's covering the majority of Americans probably over the age of 10. (laughs) Yeah. And realistically, there's technological reasons why um, streaming has become kind of the trend, right? It's not just because it's hype. It actually has some advantages relative to terrestrial broadcast or carrying around physical media. Like if you compare it just to terrestrial broadcast, for example, you're not, you're not limited to by location, right? You think about radio stations and they're kind of divided up into little territories. And if you're like us listening to radio in the Bay area and you're listening to your favorite radio station and you decide you want to drive down to LA I mean, we all remember what that was like. That meant like, oh, I've got to get my my stash of CDs ready for when I get out of range of my radio station. That doesn't really happen with streaming. You, as long as you have a wireless internet connection, you can listen to the, to the same audio source no matter where you are. Now, so that broadcast range is kind of a big deal. So you can maintain that continuity when you're traveling. 
You also are not limited by the number of radio stations that the FCC can fit into a, into a radio dial, right? So it's not like you're also not necessarily limited to what the FCC feels like they're going to grant a license. You have a lot more options as far as what your audio source is going to be. There's going to be, instead of a handful, a relative handful of, of uh, radio station options in your area, it can open up to hundreds, open up to thousands. You can listen to music from around the world. You can listen to Bollywood songs. You can listen to K-pop. You can listen to punk coming out of Sweden or whatever else you want to listen to. And then the other thing is where if you wanted to listen to a radio broadcast, you would have to have a radio receiver. So you, and that was in your car, maybe you're carrying around a boombox. Maybe you have a little transistor radio that you can plug some headphones into, but it was almost always a dedicated device. And nowadays with smartphones and uh, tablets and even computers, these are devices that are always going to be on you because they serve multiple purposes. It's not just a, a, a music consumption device or an audio consumption device. It's also you know, a communications medium. It's a productivity tool. There's all these other reasons why you're going to carry this with you. And then audio consumption is one of the things that is just available to you when it makes sense for the use case, right? And finally, and, and this is going to be a huge, uh, a huge factor, is that the metrics and analytics that you can get from streaming is just far superior to, to broadcast. This is one of the Absolutely. reasons why Netflix is the new model, right? Because you can get all of the data around like, all right, what did Brian watch? How much did he watch of it? Did he watch like the first 10 minutes and then he gave up and he found something else? Those are all, that's all, that's all data that can be really helpful into making your content decisions. Not only that, but also targeted advertising and targeted marketing. The reality is the way that it's been used, targeted advertising is kind of the devil. It's not even a question. It's just, it just is the devil right now. But it doesn't change the fact that targeted marketing and targeted advertising at a core concept is probably better than just like getting a bunch of advertising for stuff you don't care about. In that sense, it's also just much more effective for the advertisers. And then the last thing that is really a big deal for, for, um, for the companies behind it is that the cost of maintaining a few servers in order to host your content is so much cheaper than terrestrial broadcast infrastructure and having uh, like radio antennas and things in order to get your, your signal out. Like that is when you have everything else and then this other system, which has less range, which can have less users. You don't get the metrics from it. it. People listen to it less often because they have to be in certain situations where the hardware is available to, in front of them. On top of that, it's also more expensive. So with all of those things in place, it's, it's quite clear why streaming has become the go-to. You know, when you think about those different radio stations and how um, they need to evolve basically into streaming systems and mm -hmm. they need to be able to stream their shows and things like that in order to properly serve their market, right? And cover uh, the younger demographic and, and, and people who are, uh, you know, trying to pull their content that way. Over time, I think what's going to happen is those radio stations are going to either be, they're going to be forced basically to, to transfer everything into that direction. And, and the reason why that's going to happen is because, cars now are starting to emerge as basically vehicles with computers in them. Mm -hmm. And the way in which they pull their content is from the internet. And a lot of people have asked me like, well, how do they actually get internet in the cars? Well, I'll tell you right now, they use satellites. And as of, I think last week, I mean, you look at Tesla and the number of satellites they're putting up in uh, low earth orbit um, in order to help with you know, tracking their cars and also uh, in the future providing, you know, broadband internet or whatever else they're doing with it. It's a perfect example, right? Like, why would you have antennas on the car and be like grabbing these radio signals when mm -hmm. you can just be streaming this content from satellite seamlessly in your car, like, like you said, right? And it doesn't have to be just from your phone. You can put your phone away and then use your screen in the car and and get everything that you want. And I think what these radio stations have to do is just convert their users, right? So I think about some of the popular stations in the Bay Area, like Sarah and Vinny. And Sarah and Vinny started podcasting and streaming their content way before it was even popular. They've started that what I call transitionary model where the 
the, the show itself is doing really well still on radio, but that number will slowly decline over time, right? Mm-hmm. And it'll become a streaming show. And that's awesome because they're already caring and, and, and handling their users over from one platform to the other. And when that full transfer happens, seamless, right? It's, they're ready for it. And, and the show is great and it has a lot of followers and they're really funny. And I think they're going to do really well if they only, uh, even if they were only on streaming. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a model for everybody else. I think that's what they need to do. I think you're going to see radio stations turn into basically just broadcast streaming broadcast platforms, right? Yeah. That's it. It's just new companies. One of the things we, that we see is there's a certain nostalgia for certain recorded media for like, uh, especially when it comes to vinyl, right? There's, there's a, a sense of nostalgia associated with kind of the, the little pops and hisses or the warmth that you get from, from some recorded vinyl but you don't quite as much feel that for radio as a broadcast medium you do get that for radio as a content format right so that's one of the things we're going to take from radio permanently i think and one thing that some of the the streaming algorithms are a little bit missing is having that personality who you trust to curate curate content for you or to create content for you if if it's like a morning show or a talk radio person and con- continuing to insert that into the into what you're listening, so it's it can kind of the content itself can take can take a, a radio reminiscent format, but it'll be distributed through digital means. And I think that's to a large extent what podcasting is, where you have uh, a lot of talk radio style uh, podcast shows, and then you also have some great music podcasts out there. Where somebody somebody is curating all that that uh, that content together, putting it all into a podcast, and you can listen to it. And it's always, to me, as someone who really loves music, it's always really interesting what choices people make when they're putting it together like a, a curated playlist of music. If you think about that show that used to be on on Sundays on the radio, you know, it was like the top ten, the countdown. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that countdown show so popular for so long such a simple thing like top 100 song countdown right and then they would just start at number 100 number and then 99 98 and then for three or four hours or however long it takes right they go through all of them down to number one and people just loved that show so simple it's like the the casey Kasem show casey Kasem, that's it yeah I, i forgot the name but like yeah it was a casey Kasem show and I see that with podcasting. Like, mm-hmm. you, there's no reason why you can't do the same thing. You can have the Casey Kasem podcasting show and just do countdowns from the 1980s, the 1970s, yeah. 1990s, you know, and it's exciting. And, and let's talk about podcasting for a second here because I, I talk to people and it's so funny. They're like, the explosion of podcasting, it's so new. And I'm like, yeah, it's new in the sense that the general public understands it and like your mom and dad are maybe listening to a podcast now. But it actually started a lot earlier because I was doing some research and it looks like it started in the late 1980s in this thing called like audio blogging. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, um, when I used to go to those shows that I was talking about earlier, those those PC shows, uh, the swap meets and stuff, um, people used to sell their shows. You can buy them on three and a half, uh, three and a quarter inch uh, floppy disks and, and it would be like, oh, this is my show talking about how to build a PC. Yeah. Or things like that. And you pop them in your computer and you just listen to the MIDI file. So uh, the industry was poking at this area for quite some time. And then it really started to explode like in the 2000s, you know, 2004-ish, um, when y- you had the ability to listen to these shows on the go, right? Yeah. And it, it kind of opened things up. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but the show, one of the shows I used to listen to, which he still has a show today and it's very popular, um, is Leo Laporte. Oh yeah. Remember Leo? Yeah. Uh-huh. Leo's great. Right. And so he had, um, I think it was, he was on ZDNet for a while. Didn't we get to talk to him at some point? I thought we met him. We did. We, we met <laughs> actually yeah. a couple things happened. One is I actually met him at uh Comdex and, and chatted with him just for a couple seconds. You know, I don't think he'd ever remember. It was more of kind of like a meet and greet. Um, and then recently a product that you and I had invented and patented and licensed and, and sold, he actually featured on his show and as one of the, uh, his top, uh, favorite travel products. So I thought that was kind of cool because, you know, I, I'd always admired him and, and, and kind of met him. And then suddenly he's talking about a product that you and I had invented. So I thought that was pretty awesome, but his show, um, is still doing really well, but he used to call them netcasts. 
Yeah. And you'd be able to go online and and go to his website and then press play and just listen to him talk about technology. And it was fun. And now here we are, right? It's like, it shows you how, like, as I said before, like timing matters a lot. Yeah. If you, if you time the market properly, you can really grab the masses if you have a great product and a great, great experience. Um, what are some of the experiences you had with podcasting early on? Not like now where like it's everywhere, but like in the, in the mid two thousands. Well, I think I kind of got into podcasting a little bit later than you for sure. Um, and I think most of my audio experience was focused on music. So I was listening to a lot of kind of the, uh, the music app stuff are out there, even going back to like, uh, LimeWire and some of that stuff. Yeah. But, uh, one of the things that got me started with podcasting was actually, I got, I got pulled into a, uh, a fantasy football, uh, league cause they needed somebody to play. And, uh, I started, I, you know, I, I had been a, um, a fan of football for most of my life, but I had not been paying that much attention to it because I've been busy. So that was something where I was like, all right, well, I need to kind of like figure out what the lay of the land is now. So I started listening to some of those um, fantasy football and football podcasts. And it was great for me because it was something that um, usually a lot of times when I consume media, like I'm very focused on it, especially if it's something that like is related to our work or just related to an interest of mine. Then like I'll I'll shut out the world and really focus on it and I'll I'll read like two sentences and then I'll go look up stuff about it and stuff like that. Like I'll dig deep. With stuff like sports uh and comedy also or or media, it's been great for me for podcasting because it doesn't matter if I miss something. It's not something I need to like hear every word and understand every concept. I can just kind of consume it a little bit more passively. But one thing I wanted to touch on, because I know that podcast feels very new to a lot of people, but when we look at what it is, as far as from a a technological standpoint, it's still pretty bare bones, right? It's just an MP3 audio recording and paired with like an RSS file to let you know, oh, hey, there is a new episode of this podcast for you to download the MP3 and listen to. And that's that keeps it simple, but it's also missing uh, some of the functionality that you might see from like a Netflix, for example, like it's, I don't believe you can do something right now where you can start playing a podcast on one device and then pause it and then just pick it up on another device and and it'll, it'll just kind of pick up where you left off. So those are some things where I think podcasts from a technological standpoint is still because, and now because it's, it's, uh, it's getting so much more attention and people are generating money within it that it's going to it's going to cause that element of podcast to catch up. Yeah, I, I think where it's intriguing for me is that we are at a place in our society now where if you want to hear the thoughts of let's say a professor at Harvard University talking about you know what he or she thinks about the genome project or something, mm-hmm. you can probably find that podcast and yeah. listen to them. And before we really kind of had this, you almost had to hope that they got interviewed or something by like a television station or a radio station to gather any information at all about that person, what their research is, what they're doing. And now we've kind of opened it up so someone around the people around the world can just listen to these interesting conversations. Um, it means that you definitely have to do a lot of your own homework. Not that you didn't do it before, but like mm-hmm. you know, if someone says something, you really got to go research it to make sure that's it's true what they say. But the the fact is is that being able to find like experts and people in uh, in, in industries that you've never even heard from, but would like to learn from Mm -hmm. can do this. And the barrier to entry is very low. Like if I wanted to learn about sharks and there was a, um, shark expert in the university of Hawaii doing a podcast, suddenly I can have this general base of knowledge just by listening to them on a regular basis about how they think about research and kind of explore the world of sharks, right? Like that's amazing. It's so much easier than trying to find some sort of CD or something at the library and listening to it like it was 20 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that it's one of the, um, like the, the need for a little bit of advancement within podcasting and the availability of content. And it has a lot of overlap with YouTube 
uh, services like that. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, before Joe Rogan signed his agreement with, uh, with uh, Spotify, uh, a lot of him and a lot of others were also putting out their streams on YouTube. And Mm -hmm. I think part of it was because it it was easier for some people to consume through that means. It also provided them a video channel to accompany, to accompany the audio channel, but it also provided a lot of the, the analytics that they couldn't get elsewhere of like, right. Well, did people pause? Did they stop? Like how much did they listen to it? Are there spikes in certain areas? Those are things that while reaching a broad audience, it also provided more information back to the, to the content creator. And because you didn't have to get some studio on board, like to your point, you could have whoever you wanted on your podcast. And obviously we're doing that too, right? We're, we're, it's kind of meta us uh, podcasting about a podcast, but you can, <laughs> you can have anybody you want on where a, if you're trying to take it to like some kind of a network show, they might say, Oh, well that's too niche. We need something big, bigger and more mainstream because the opportunity cost on this distribution channel is too great. But for us within a podcast, we're like, well, it's just, you know, a half hour to an hour of our time. Let's just get this person on the phone and hear what they have to say. That availability on the channel, that's something also that's limited within radio broadcasts of like, all right, well, you have one channel, right? You're, the FCC allows you one chunk of bandwidth to distribute your, your content. It's not like you can have multiple simultaneous options available to users, you have to put one thing out. You have to decide what that one thing is going to be. And that's something that podcasts are not limited by. That's why I love them so much. Like really, I mean, there's there's so much I have learned by listening to all these different amazing podcasts that are out there. And anytime somebody asks me, like, do you think I should start a podcast? I'm like, if you feel like you have something interesting to say, or you've been in an industry for a really long time and you have opinions, yeah, by all means, do it. There's a lot of people out there. I mean, even with our podcast, I was really shocked because I thought that our uh, our listeners, who you and I love so much because they're kind of keeping this thing going every week, um, I thought they would be concentrated to mostly like c- uh, bigger cities and things like that. And it's been amazing to see it, it spread all the way across almost most of the states in the in the United States. We have some listeners in, in almost every state. In addition to like people in Israel, people in Bruges, Belgium, like we have listeners all over the world. I have we have one person in Russia that listens every week, and we have basic uh, data to indicate that. And I think it's so neat that they're interested and sometimes reach out to us, and so. I find it very joyful to be able to share what I know and my opinions. And if they if they like it, then they can listen. If they don't, then there's so many other podcasts they can yeah. listen to as well, right? And podcasting is so accessible. Like it's it's if you want to get a message out, if you want to create a podcast, there's not a lot of reason why not to do it. Like it's it's not a huge financial commitment. It's not a huge amount of work. It's not like you have to quit your your day job in order to do it. Uh, it's one of those things where if you feel like you have something to say, then give it a shot and maybe it will work out for you. Maybe it will not. But if it doesn't, it's it's not like you've sacrificed a great deal in order to try it. Agreed. Hey, and with that said, let's talk about the new emerging trend of social audio. So mm-hmm. these um, new apps like Clubhouse, Twitter Spaces, and I guess there's uh, one in development now with um, Facebook, and I'm sure more will emerge. Very interesting point. Something popped into my mind this morning about these. So just to kind of uh, kind of give everyone a summary, if you're not familiar, Clubhouse and Twitter spaces are these new places where you can invite groups of people to come in and do group chat. Yep. So let's say, for example, Demetrius and I wanted to talk about the emerging trends of the audio, right? We can put on a Clubhouse, invite a certain number of people, they log in, and then you can kind of control the environment and let certain people talk and that kind of stuff. So it's almost like doing a fireside chat, but you're doing it um, remotely. Well, it's interesting because I was talking to a friend who did fantasy football for 15 or 16 years. And he said that every quarter before they started, but before the season would start, they would have these group chats and basically they paid to have a conference call. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think they used to be like 1-800-CONFERENCE CALL or something like that, right? They would pay for an hour and then everyone would log in and they would have all these conversations on there. And I just thought it was funny that he was was telling me about this because I was like, oh my gosh, that's basically what these things are now. 
Yeah. Is instead of using a conference call number, you're doing conference calls via kind of a podcast social platform? Well, it's interesting. I, I think that it's from a from a technological standpoint, there's nothing really like mind blowing about it, right? It's it's a, it's the equivalent to like the old party line that people used to have. It's just audio, everybody calling in together. If you could do Skype or Zoom with like 20 people, then it's it's technologically not at all challenging in order to do that through an audio following. What is interesting to me is that it took this long for the tech industry to realize, oh, hey, there's there here's an untapped channel that we haven't gotten into. That's actually not that difficult to do. And the reality is, Video has its place, but audio alone also has its place. And it's something that they haven't really tapped yet. And it it's now there's, there's a hunger for this stuff because it's not really available. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they're blowing up on the other side of things. Whenever, whenever we're working on something social, we have to keep in mind that it's not just about the experience of the consumer. It's also the experience of the contributor. It's also the experience of the other person on, on that, the side of that interaction because now we're we're dealing with um, matching up two different two different participants within the system, right? So for Clubhouse, one of the things I think it's been really helpful for them is that for someone like an Elon Musk or a LeBron James or whoever else or a Jay Z or whoever else is is uh, participating in these, it's so much easier to just hop on a call or to hop on a microphone or something than it is to actually figure out how to record your video in a good, compelling way, worry about how you're, you're framed up, your lighting, all that stuff and distribute that. And uh, one of the things we definitely see this, like the rise of text messaging, right? Why, why is that? Why did that become so popular? It's because it's lightweight and it's easy for people to engage with. So I think that's one of the things that's driving this phenomenon is that for people who want to get their message out, people who are celebrities or, or big names or influential people, it's so lightweight and easy compared to recording video and putting it out there. I 100% agree with that because when I do recordings and they're video, there's all that prep time, right? Yeah. But when it comes to audio, I can just walk right in, turn it on and be like, hey, how's it going? And just jump right in. And I feel like people enjoy that casualness of it. Also, you and I have realized something over the years. I think we've realized that when it's audio only, people tend to be a little bit more open and they tend to go into a little bit more depth. Yeah. It's more comfortable right? in general. Like I have a friend yeah. who's a C-level executive. We've been friends for over 20 years. She's a C-level executive in a, in a startup, and they're doing really well. She absolutely refuses to, per, to turn her camera on when she's doing calls. It's like, <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to see my face. That's not what this is about. We're transmitting information back and forth. So it's like, you know what? I think there's a lot of people who are like, I feel so much more comfortable when it's audio only. And we do that too, right? We do interviews with with people all the time, um, not just for the podcast, but but uh in, in our, uh, our normal day-to-day work. And there's such a sense of relief when we're on a call with somebody and we tell them, uh, we don't need your video for this. We're going to be sharing screens and things. You can go ahead and turn your camera off. You can see it on their face. Oh yeah. The response is always like, oh, okay, cool. And then they turn it off and then they're so open and honest and helpful for what we're doing. Yeah. yeah they love it. Absolutely. And so I, I try to promote that all the time. Uh, for people. And like, when I look at these companies though, and I want to get your perspective on this. So Clubhouse is like a brand new company. I mean, the person who founded it is a entrepreneur that has been uh, done a couple other things, you know, in the past and, and this is his new venture, but people like Twitter and Facebook, I mean, they're kind of primed for this because they already have this massive audience, right? And all they have to do is enable this feature. And you say, Oh, oh, hey, I'm going to add D and I'm going to add this friend and that friend and that friend and I'm going to click group combo or whatever, right? And boom, instantly we're having a group conversation. I mean, I kind of feel like, you know, at the end, the winner's going to be whoever can, who has the biggest audience and then makes this user experience very simple and and seamless, right? Like even Google can do this, right? They can do it really well. Well, everybody can. And that's one of the reasons why it hasn't been, hasn't caught on quite as easily. So you think back to when YouTube came out and I remember- 
thinking to myself at the time, how do they do this? Like, how do they, how are they hosting all this video? How do they get the bandwidth to get this out? Like back then it was like, it was a real technological accomplishment to do that. I, I don't think that distributing audio the way that it is, is really a technological accomplishment. There are some UX stuff to figure out. Like when you're on an audio call with multiple people, it becomes like, well, how do we make sure that nobody's voice gets, uh, doesn't get a chance to, to contribute or make sure people don't step on each other? Like there's some UX stuff to figure out, right? But beyond that, I think one of the major reasons why audio, especially social audio, hasn't become, uh, has taken so long to kind of catch on is that it's actually too easy to copy. It's too easy to implement. So it's becomes like, all right, well, there's no way for for us to do something proprietary or unique, kind of like YouTube did when they did it. It anybody can just bump, uh, dumping a bunch of audio streams into a, into a shared space, and then everybody t- are talking with each other. It's it seems more like a commodity than something that's going to be a unique proprietary system. So yeah, I, I think you know, getting into our, our predictions for the future, I think one of the things either. There will be some innovator who really kind of reconceives the entire concept of a social audio platform and will come up with something that none of us can see today because by its very nature, it's going to be innovative. It's going to be different. It's going to be groundbreaking. Or if that doesn't happen, this socialized audio is just going to be a commodity and everybody is going to have it on their platform. And it's at that point, it doesn't really deserve to be a company per se. It's just going to be mm-hmm. a feature within other people's platforms that, you know, Spotify See, that, is going to have, of, you know, Twitter, Google, Facebook, they're all going to have it. Yeah. See, that's kind of what I predict, yeah. right? Cause I know like Mark, Mark Cuban started up something called Fireside. Um, and I think that it's, if it becomes really popular, then why wouldn't everybody just do it? I don't even think you can patent, you know what I mean? Or like no, lock you out the IP on that. I don't think you can, right? It's just more no. of like who has the has the best user experience and makes it available in the beginning. And then after that, it's just whatever one you want to use, kind of like video conferencing tools or whatever. But I did have one question before we talk about our future predictions and wrap up. Do you think that this form of audio is going to take over like in-person meetings, conference calls, or the traditional fireside conference chats that people would wait a whole year to do at CES or South by Southwest. You know what I mean? Like by having it so readily available, do you think you're just going to see some of those start to tamper down a little bit? Um, I don't, to, to some extent, maybe I don't think it's, I think it'll sit alongside it. I don't think it's going to take it over. So one of the things that clubhouse kind of reminds me of is like a panel discussion at like South by Southwest or Comic Con, right? Where you, you have a bunch of people who are experts in the field or uh, creators who are all participating in one thing. Like maybe you have like your your uh, your one division Marvel panel at South at uh, Comic Con, right? And they're all talking about like what it took in order to create that vision and bring it to the screen. That's something that is much easier to do on a platform like Clubhouse or a platform like, like honestly, uh, Zoom or YouTube or something, right? You can have them all sign in and then distribute it. So I think that we're going to see from a, a use case perspective, right, that use case continue to grow where you can have people, they don't all have to be in the same city, uh, the logistics of it, right? Like make uh, if uh, Robert Downey Jr. is filming a, uh, something in Europe, then he doesn't need to hop on a plane in order to participate at this panel in San Diego. Um, they can all just do it remotely and then work together. And then it puts out some compelling content for people to listen to. So I think that will sit alongside a lot of the other things. I don't know that it's necessarily going to be kind of an audio only platform. It seems like the kind of thing that might benefit from having a simultaneous distribution of audio only and audio plus video, because when it comes to some of the, some of the personalities that clubhouse attracts at some point, you kind of want to see them like not every time, but like, you know, sometimes for example, I I like to listen to, to Kevin Smith's uh, fat man beyond podcast. Mm Mm-hmm. And sometimes I listen to it and sometimes I put it on YouTube and watch it. And he records in, f- in front of a live audience, which I think is great. And someday when I get the chance to get back to, to LA after the pandemic is over, I, I plan to actually go there and, and catch the podcast recording in person. 
I think all of those, uh, just like it all kind of like sits alongside each other for, for Kevin Smith's podcast. I think that's what is going to be the future for almost every form of content when it, in, in this kind of space. Yeah. I think as more tools emerge like this, it's just another nail in the coffin with people doing short-term travel. Honestly, I feel like this whole, like, Oh, I'm going to fly to LA to stay at this little hotel and then, you know, run down the street, go do this two hour conversation in a conference room, go back to my hotel, pack up my bag, get on an airplane, fly all the way home. You know, people talk about this in regard to like the change because of the pandemic. I hear this all the time. Mm -hmm. I think these tools are kind of like putting that nail in the coffin, right? Of like, we don't need to, like I have a 4k uh, camera on my computer, right? Like I'm going to look exactly the same in the room as if I'm sitting there for the most part. And then if they don't want to do video, now we have all these platforms to be able to have these conversations. It's just showing how technology is enabling us to be more free, right? And giving us the ability to do things in the way that we want. And that kind of does come to our predictions. And I'll go back into that because that's where you were, you were heading. But like from my perspective, all of these different tools are going to be commonplace. Like you said, Zoom. And I first thought was, boom, Zoom can do this. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? Why not? They have the technical capability. They have the the money to do it. They have the team to do it. Like they can just implement this and you're on a Zoom and just say, hey guys, you want to start a fireside chat at five? Okay, great. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Set it up, select it. You're you're all set on Zoom. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's pretty much a Zoom installation sitting on just about every single person's device to, that is operating in media or technology right now. Yeah, absolutely. So what are your predictions then um, on this kind of terrestrial broadcast transition that seems to be happening right now? Like, do you, do you feel like, you know, five years or 10 years down the road, suddenly like traditional radio will just be gone and we'll, we'll all go, wow, I can't believe it's over? Well, I think that radio as a format for content, like we mentioned before, will, will, will kind of have a resurgence and will be around for pretty much for as long as we're having distributed audio experiences, right? I think that um, with curated a- curation algorithms right now, to me, they all sound the same. There's nothing unique about them. There's nothing proprietary. There's nothing differential about one algorithm versus another. Uh, I think that those will get better. We'll get more um, more tailoring to an individual user's tastes. Um, you'll get a little bit better about transition from song to song so that they make sense. Um, you might even get a little bit of theming built into the curation algorithm so you can have kind of an ad hoc. You might even have some kind of curated theming with an album so you can have something like an old uh, Who album where it went through a single storyline throughout every song within the album. You could potentially have something like that within curated curation algorithms for them to create experiences like that. But at the same time, I think what we're going to see is kind of a resurgence in human curation and some of those uh, human curated playlists kind of being blended with algorithms or being augmented by algorithms. And a lot of those will be people who are, you know, media personalities who are major artists, you know, what is, what is Billie Eilish listening to? What is Lady Gaga listening to? I think there's a lot of interest in kind of what music they would pick and then have that have it algorithms help them and make it easier. So it's not a, not a huge commitment for them to do so. The Rock recently did this. Actually, he released yeah. his workout uh, playlist, and so oh, yeah. you can I you can down on Spotify. You can download his playlist and then listen to everything that he listens to uh, when he works out every day. Yeah, and I think it'll ultimately it'll kind of become a regular thing where like every Sunday at two p.m., you know, some major artist releases a playlist, and it'll be easy for them because there will be algorithms that will help them with music discovery with with figuring out like. Uh, what songs can kind of go to be- go together? F- for me, like I used to be on uh, on turntable, right? And for one of the things I would try to do on that was would be try to find new music that people hadn't heard before, and that, that's like another job. That's that's quite a bit of work, like yeah. trying to find music that nobody's ever heard before that is worthy of being heard and doing that kind of music discovery. Uh, and I think some some experiences can, can get optimized for those different use cases, whether you want to hear stuff that you've heard a million times before that is kind of like that comfy blanket, or if you want to optimize for discovering new music you've never heard before, some of the hidden gems that have been around forever, or some of the up and, up and coming artists that nobody's that people don't know enough about yet that deserve to, to know more. Any, any other final thoughts or predictions uh, coming down the 
pipeline here in the next like couple of years? I mean, I, I yeah. just really think that, you know, we are in a phase right now where things are just getting easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper. And because of that, I feel like it's just giving people a lot of choice. And that's what I love seeing. I think in the, in the future, it's just going to be about choice. You have, you can, you can get anything you want pretty much from 10 different companies. Yeah. I think one of the other things that stands out and we kind of touched on this a little bit is that ultimately terrestrial broadcast radio as a form of distribution, just like, actually um, sending out audio over the airwaves through these massive radio antennas. I think, I think their days are numbered. Um, ultimately the most reliable way to predict how a technology or an industry or a market is going to go and how that change is going to happen is looking at the economic incentives behind it. And I think the economic incentives for switching from these, uh, terrestrial broadcast systems to internet streaming is just insurmountable. I think these radio stations are mostly going to be kind of backup and maybe they'll, they'll kind of exist. But other than that, it, it might be limited to almost uh, like public access or uh, emergency radio stuff. Other than that, like almost all consumption is going to move online. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up the podcast. Thank you all for listening. Um, please subscribe if you haven't. Please tell a friend. Also, this is our second to last episode before the end of season two, which I cannot believe is already here. And then we have a real big season three. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have some some great interviews, a, a big guest that is going to talk about uh, some interesting topics. So um, all right, everyone, have a great day and we'll see you next week.